4.3, where today we're going to be taking a look at graphs of exponential functions, and in general, just kind of like what do they what do they do with regard to their parameters, and uh, what are some different ways that we can interpret things graphically. So, without further ado, let's uh, kind of re recap our parent function. So, obviously, our formula f of x is equal to a times b to the power of x is our parent function for exponentials, right? And we said that the parameters a and b, a was our initial value, right? We said that b was our growth factor, okay? That very specific term, and keep in mind, always written as a decimal, so don't ever include a percentage as a growth factor, okay? <clears throat> and therefore, uh, you know, we're going to focus today a lot on the effects of these two things graphically. So the effect of parameter a, we had actually started looking at these back when, uh, well, I guess 4.1, when we originally graphed them, right? <clears throat> and we saw the distinction between decay and then uh, growth. And in both cases, the effect of parameter A was really just our y-intercept, okay? The y-intercept for either type, right? Any type of exponential function, A was always going to be where we cross the y-axis. And the effect of parameter B obviously is going to indicate growth or decay, okay? Growth or decay, it was growth whenever b was larger than 1. It was decay whenever b was between 0 and 1. And that's really, you know, how we, we uh, decided on, some, param uh, on some, <laughs> some restrictions for parameter b, right? Growth is when b was greater than 1. Decay is when 0 is less than b, which is less than 1. So that's what you're looking for. But what does that mean graphically? Well, obviously in the case of growth, that means with consecutive inputs, we're going up right? And with decay, with consecutive outputs, we're going to be going down. But we also talked about how in either case you're going to have this horizontal asymptote, right? And so either to the left in the case of growth or to the right in the case of decay here, we will approach a finite value, okay? Which is obviously a distinction from the opposite side of the graph, okay? The other end, all right, <clears throat> so I think it's important that we understand how these uh, horizontal asymptotes work, okay? It says that for the exponential function, f of x is equal to a times b raised to the power of x. The x-axis is a horizontal asymptote because f of x approaches 0 as x gets large in either the positive or negative direction. And so when we're talking about large, we literally just mean big numbers, right? They could be negative, they could be positive, but... Again, that's what's happening as we reach the ends of our, our inputs. Let's look at this for you know, exponential growth and decay. And this is actually really what I want you to focus on, because we've already kind of seen what this looks like. We know we will be approaching our horizontal or x-axis here. But it's more about this notation. This is notation you're going to use a tremendous amount in future mathematics courses, specifically calculus, though. Um, as x approaches, so that's what this means, this means approaches. As x approaches negative infinity in the case of exponential growth, so as this value goes farther and farther left, what is our y value doing with regard to our function? So you'll notice our y value is decreasing, right? So f of x is approaching 0 as that input approaches negative infinity, okay? So y equals 0 is, of course, our horizontal asymptote, just like we referred to earlier. And, of course, it's flipped for the case of exponential decay. As x approaches positive infinity, as we go farther and farther right, our outputs, f of x, will approach 0. So you'll notice these dip, right? And we get closer and closer to that value of 0. So that means y equals 0 is our horizontal asymptote. And I think it's important to remember that asymptotes are values you will not achieve. Okay? We, will we will get infinitely close to them without actually uh, reaching them. Okay, So there we go. <clears throat> so in general, y equals k is a horizontal asymptote of the function if uh, f, if the function values get close to k as x gets large, either positively or negatively. I want you to look at that notation. I hope that looks really familiar to everybody because we've often talked about this function notation a times f of the quantity b of x minus h plus k, right? 
And so you've seen on multiple occasions what the H and the K do as far as translating your function, right? This is our interior shift and therefore it was horizontal in the reverse of the value in the direction that reverses the value that we see because of the negative. And then the outside value is really your, your uh, vertical shift, right? It's gonna take you up or down. And that's the reason why y equals k makes a lot of sense when you go back to your function notation, right? You'll notice <clears throat> in these cases we've looked at so far, there is no added or subtracted constant on the end. And that's the reason why it's over and over again, it's this value that's zero, okay? Let's also think about that value that's a real fast, okay? If I had a negative starting quantity, it wouldn't often make sense in the context of applied problems. But you, you would very well start to see uh, growth and decay in their own kind of way where you're crossing your y-axis just at negative values and yet still approaching that output of zero, assuming k is zero, all right? So again, this notation even applies to exponential functions, something you guys are far less familiar with. All right, <clears throat> so it says we're often interested in solving equations involving exponential functions. For now, we do this graphically, but obviously in algebra two, you guys learned how to do this using logarithms, right? And that's really gonna take place next unit when we talk about inverse functions. This is all about the introduction to exponentials. And then like I said, as we move forward, you guys are gonna notice, and by the way, that's, that's really gonna happen semester two. But, but again, you guys are gonna notice uh, that <laughs> logarithms really are just inverse functions of exponentials, okay? Um, I'm guessing you guys didn't graph those or did so very rarely anyways. So it's gonna look a little bit weird at the beginning, but, um, but again, that's kind of how they relate. So it says a 200 gram sample of carbon-14 decays according to the formula Q equals 200 times 0.886 to the power of T, okay, as time passes. Now I do wanna point out, this is the exact same equation that we looked at back in 4.1, okay? where t is in thousands of years, okay? Identical. Estimate when there are 25 grams of carbon-14 left. So let's think about that. If I wanna know the quantity of carbon-14, um, let me rephrase that. <laughs> if I'm locking down the quantity of carbon-14 at exactly 25 grams, and we know that Q represents the quantity of the, uh, you know, the element we're discussing, we could of course just say Q is equal to 25, right? Now separately, we have this other equation, Q is equal to 200 times a 0.886 raised to the power of T. So let's quickly recap what they're talking about up here. Using logarithms, <clears throat> we could say that Q is equal to 25 and therefore I wanna know when my output is 25 for an initial value of 200 with this decay rate. Okay, it will eventually get there, it's decaying, right? This value is less than one. It's just a matter of when, what time would that be? Well, you gotta realize, if we plug that in here, 25 equals 200 times 0.886 to the power of t, that's now a one variable equation. And you guys should be able to solve the vast majority of those, right? The issue is that your one variable is the exponent, and that's why the logarithms were referenced up above, okay? So let's instead look at a way that you guys can go about uh, solving problems like this just using calculators, using the graph, okay? I've got these two, so let's go ahead and set them up as our y1 and y2, okay? 25 is the first, the second is 200 times 0.886 raised to the power of x. Keep in mind inputs are always x. Also, make sure that you're using parentheses here. You don't wanna have this uh, taking like the, the whole quantity by moving the parentheses in the wrong location. So just kinda take it easy. And then I think we can all agree that if I'm looking for an output of 25 over some amount of time, I'm gonna have to adjust my window, okay? Now my Y minimum can be zero, but my Y maximum should be at least 25. Maybe even 50 would be easier for us to see, okay? We also know that this isn't going to take place back in time, so I can start at values of zero. And then I think over the course of 10,000 years, we'll likely get there, okay? So let's go ahead and graph this and just see what happens. Well, we didn't, did we? So 10,000 years wasn't enough time. Let's go ahead and extend that window. Maybe we'll go out to 30,000 years, okay? So three times the number of inputs here. There we go. Okay, so it, it actually was hitting back in this range of values just a little bit past 10. 
And now we, of course, see where the two cross, right? And so essentially all you're doing is you're setting up a system of equations. They're just not both linear, okay? Well, if they're not linear, like I said, you would have to have other methods to solve it, like logarithms. So in our case, given that we haven't reintroduced those yet, let's go ahead and just hit second trace. We'll go to our calculate feature, and we will find the intersection, okay? So I can now find the intersection between the first and second curves, and it will guess. Keep in mind, these are estimates. But it's saying a little more than 17,000 years in, we should go ahead and reach that 25-gram uh, sample, okay? So estimate when there are 25 grams of carbon-14 left. I'm going to go ahead and try to do this a little bit more accurately. So we will say it roughly. If this is thousands of years, I will move the decimal place 3 to the right by multiplying by 1,000 and get 17,180 years later. Okay? All right. So hopefully the process makes sense. It's really not a tough one. You just let your calculator do a lot of the work. So part B says the Earth's atmosphere pressure atmospheric pressure P in terms of height above sea level is often modeled by an exponential decay function, okay? The pressure at sea level is 1,013 millibars. The pressure decreases by 14% for every kilometer up, okay? What is the atmospheric pressure at 50 kilometers? Well, if we're going to evaluate that, we need to go ahead and set up our equation based around these, you know, these uh, variables. So, P is in terms of height, right? So the pressure is equal to, we know our initial, which is at sea level, right, is going to be 1,013 millibars. We know that it's decaying 14%. And so if I take my 100%, subtract off 14%, I'm left with 86% or 0.86 as a growth factor, right? So that's our, our typical B conversion that we talked about last time. We sub add or subtract R and then just divide by 100, right? So we're going to multiply this by 0.86, and it says it's a function based around height above sea level, right? So for every kilometer above sea level, let's go ahead, go ahead and call that H, okay? H for height. So what is the atmospheric pressure at 50 kilometers? That's when H in kilometers would be 50, right? So P is equal to 1,013 times 0.86 raised to the 50th power. Let's see what we're dealing with here. And there we have it. We went from, I just realized there's a bad glare there. Okay, so we went from about 1,013 millibars over to about 0.54, okay? This has decayed quite a bit over these 50 kilometers, so roughly 0.54 millibars, okay? All right. Next up, it says to estimate the altitude H at which the pressure equals 900 millibars. So P is equal to 900. We also know that P is equal to 1,013 times 0.86 raised to the power of H. And of course, we can solve this using the same method we just discussed. Let's go ahead and evaluate that using our graph graphing features, okay? Now, I didn't change my window, so we're just going to have to see when this makes sense for us. I think we can all agree that uh, bare minimum we're going to have to change our range value to, you know, 900. But really, making that even 1,000 could be very helpful. So let's go ahead and pop it up to 1,000. Hmm. Well, there we go. We see our point of intersection rather quickly, don't we? So all I'm going to do, again, is the calculate intersect feature between our two curves. And it's estimating that at about... 0.784, okay, 0.784. Estimate the altitude H, so H is roughly 0.784 kilometers. Obviously, that would be about 784 meters, all right? Finally, we'll continue on to our last page here. It says, uh, finding an exponential function for data. In unit one, we use linear regression to determine the equation of the line of best fit for a set of data. Let's look at a situation where exponential regression would, be, would better describe a situation, okay? So our example says the table below gives the population in thousands for the Houston metro area since 1900, okay? So we've got T, 0, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50. We've got N, 184, 236, 332, etc. 
Now you'll notice the T values continue on up to 110 here. In reality, this would have been much better served if that piece had been below here. So that's your input. And then this one would continue for our outputs, okay? So if you want to color code it or something, just keep in mind these are your outputs. The other ones, of course, would be your inputs, okay? All right. <clears throat> so graph the data in your scatter plot and describe what you see. Let's go ahead and set that up. We're just going to do stat edit, okay? Set up our lists. And so keep in mind, you're just going 0 through 110 by multiples of 10. Next up, for our outputs here, we'll go ahead and set this up using list 2. So we've got our inputs, we've got our outputs, and it says to graph the data in your scatter plot. So let's think about this real fast. As far as windows go, I think X is from 0 to maybe 120. And you know what? Let's even go negative 10. That way we're a little bit farther left than right than the actual data shows us. Okay. Um, and then for our Y values, it looks like we'll need uh, 184 up to 59.47. So I think we just go um, 0 through... It's going to be like 6,100. That way, again, we're making sure that we're outside those bounds a little bit. Um, finally, keep in mind, we haven't necessarily st set up our stat plot, and we have old functions. So let's go ahead and do that. Second y equals. We're going to go ahead and turn this on. There's your data plot with list 1 and list 2, so it looks good. I'm going to change this over to the individual points. I just prefer it over the boxes. And then also, let's clear out our old functions. So there we go. Now, obviously, looking at that, that doesn't appear to be linear. But the problem is, it looks like it could be modeled by a quadratic, by a cubic, by degree 4, degree 5, degree 6. I mean, there are loads of them that have that going to the right, OK? So <clears throat> graph the data in your scatter plot. Describe what you see. We do see more than linear growth, OK? Now, as far as what that actually means, it's kind of hard to say, isn't it? Okay? We don't know exactly what more than linear growth means. All right? Write the equation of best fit. Now, the equation of best fit, earlier they'd asked us to go ahead and use exponential regression. So we're going to go ahead and run through that using our regression. So go to stat, calculate. And if we scroll on down here, you're going to notice, for me, it's zero is exponential regression. We're going to set that up with list one and list two. And let's actually store this, and that way I don't have to carry it over here in a second. Keep in mind, you just hit the vars button variables, go to y variables, function, and then y1. So this will now be stored as my y1 equation. Down, calculate. Okay? So I want you to look at these values. You'll notice the r value we're getting, the r squared and the r value are very close to one. It seems to be a really good fit. And when you look at the initial value of, of about 189, and then your growth factor of about 1.03. Um, I think it makes sense just from a visual standpoint based on the data we've been given. Okay? So <clears throat> we're now graphing it. Seems to just about pass through most of those first points, and then we kind of come back around to one or two at the end. All right? <clears throat> so write the equation of best fit. I really should have, uh, well, you know what? We can go back to y equals now. And we can just use this value. I'm just going to go a couple decimal places out. So I'm using 189.88. Okay. So I'm going to set this up as f of x. You know what? We really shouldn't. We've got t and n, don't we? So n is equal to our initial value is 189.88. Our growth factor there appears to be about 1.033. And our inputs are t values, right? So we'll raise this to the power of t. So there we go. The equation of best fit based on the parameters we were given. So now interpret the parameters of your formula and use it to predict the population in 2018. I'm going to let you decide exactly how you want to interpret these. So pause the video, write out a couple sentences. 
All right, so hopefully what you guys decided was that 189.88, if we're talking about the population in thousands of the Houston metro area since 1900, would tell us that in the year 1900, according to this model, there were about 189,000 people, right? And then as far as our growth factor, 1.033, tells us we're growing at a rate of about 3.3% annually, right? Okay. Um, and then predict the population in 2018. Well, 2018, let's think about that. If I take away 1990, my sort of beginning timeline, then of course I would be left with 118 years, right? And if I have 118 years, that's the same as the number of years after 1990. So all I've really got to do here is enter as a second equation y equals 118. We'll graph it. I'm sorry, I just realized t, <laughs> t is actually the time in years after the fact. My, my bad there. Um, so we're going to go ahead and actually we could just use the table or we could use the calculate feature here. So we'll go ahead and clear that out. Yeah, value. So we'll let it regraph. So if we go second, calculate. We can go ahead and find the value when x is 118. And what we're getting there is about 9457. So that would be our population in thousands, right? <coughs> so that would be, well, that would equate to about 9,457,000 people. And there you go. So hopefully that was a bit of a learning moment. Obviously, flipping up your variables can definitely throw, <laughs> throw your uh, final interpretation off. So sorry for that. Um, if you guys have any questions moving forward, please let me know. And you guys can, can continue on to your homework now. Good luck.